Law. Um, I'm Diana Maxfield. Uh, when I had been Muslim about seven years, my husband came to me one Ramadan and said, I have a gift for you if you'd like to take it. I said, sure, hand it over. <coughs> he said, uh, the gift is actually my grandmother's name. Uh, if you'd like to take her name, I would like for you to take it. So I took the name Najiya. It means one who is saved. And it's a very old Arabic name. Not many people have this name anymore. It's kind of like Bertha or Gertrude. It's kind of <laughs> fallen out of favor, but I think it's nice. I always try to get people to name their children Najiya, if you ever. <laughs> um, so everybody here, most of the people who are from the Islamic community know me as Najiya. I was raised American Baptist in the middle of Kansas uh, on the prairies of uh, near Hutchinson. And I don't know uh, what you may know, or may or may not know about Baptist. <laughs> um, but it's a form of Protestant Christianity, and it is almost the direct opposite of orthodoxy. Not to say that it's uh, the farthest you can get from the correct path, but in the, in the sense that orthodoxy involves ritual and it involves um, memorized prayers, and prayers that you say at specific times for specific things, um, and it's much more structured. Um, as a Baptist, when I was growing up, um, we were actually taught that ritual prayer was um, something that was empty. People just memorized it and said it didn't do their spirituality any good. So we were steered away from all kinds of ritual. And um, when I was 11, I told my parents that I wanted to become a missionary. I was very, uh, at that time in my life and throughout my teenage years, I was very, very dedicated to uh, Christianity. I sang in the choir and I played flute in the, uh, for the choir and um, I went to youth group. We went three times a week to church and I really wanted to, I really wanted to become the kind of person who was close to God. And when I say God, I mean God, because even when I was Christian, I would always pray before I would go to bed at night, I would say, dear God, please, blah, 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 blah. I didn't pray um, through Jesus, although I guess at the end of our prayers, we usually said, um, in Jesus' name, amen. Um, and that was, to me, just something that we said. I always addressed my prayers to God. So I, I believe that I was kind of monotheistic in, um, in belief before I even became Muslim. And then I grew up and I got married. Um, and I married a man who was from Syria. Uh, and he was Muslim. And I dragged him to church several times. I took him to church on Easter, no less. And I really tried to talk to him about faith because I really wanted him to be saved. Because the church that I grew up in taught that unless you believe that Jesus was God incarnate, unless you believe that Jesus died for your sins, then you are damned. That's just all there is to it. It's very Trinitarian kind of belief. Um, so he came to church with me, and he never said anything about religion. He never dissed Christianity. He never promoted Islam. He just went, and he was respectful. My parents were there. He was very nice and kind. But he just never, um, he, he just wasn't coming around, you know. So. I decided when I saw him fasting in Ramadan, and I saw him praying, I said, you know, subhanAllah, I guess I didn't say subhanAllah, but I said, you know, <laughs> this guy has a relationship with God, and it's more disciplined and more, uh, more evident in his life than my relationship with God. So, Maybe I better look into this Islam thing and see what, what's up. Because either one of two things will happen. Either I'll find the weaknesses, and then I'll be able to, I'll know how to talk to him better about Christianity, or I'll find some guidance. So he had given me as a dowry, bless his heart, four books about Islam. One, uh, three of them I don't remember. <laughs> and they were like Islamic focus or some kind of very like intro to Islam kind of books. But one of them was called The Bible, the Quran, and Science. And this is the book that really spoke to me. 
Allahi, everybody who I've ever talked to who has become Muslim has something that spoke to them. There's a guy in Syria who became Muslim because he saw the people lining up at the, at the Kaaba when it was time for Salah. Like during Ramadan or during Hajj, it was like they would call the Adhan, everybody would line up, and then they'd start the prayer right away. And this man was in the military. And he said, do you know what we have to go through to train men to stand in line like that? Allah, Allah, Allah. <laughs> so everybody has something that speaks to them, and you never know what's going to touch somebody else's heart. Subhanallah, for me, it was science. And it wasn't, it didn't, it was like I always say, becoming Muslim is not an event, it's a process. Even for people who are born Muslim. So I, I read this book, and I said to myself, okay, this Quran talks about embryology. It talks about how in the embryo the bones are created before the flesh. It talks about um, tectonic plate theory. It talks about iron as not being something of terrestrial origin, something that came down from the sky. It talks about the barrier between salt water and fresh water, which is so amazing. SubhanAllah, because when Quran talks about something, Allah doesn't just say, oh, yeah, by the way, there's a barrier. It is so detailed. It is described so beautifully as being something that has the characteristics of both a prison and a barrier. So check it out. You have a river that's flowing down into the sea. Or even if you have two seas that are different uh, saline content, the one the fresher water comes into the uh, saline water, salty water, and the salty water is all out here. And even if it's a waterfall, they don't mix. They mix in a very specific way that takes a very long time and maintains this barrier. Now, the things that live in fresh water cannot live in salt water. It's a different pressure, it's a different, the osmosis, you know, all that science stuff. They can't live there. The things that live in salt water, you can't put them in fresh water. They can't live in fresh water. And the things that live in between, in the area that is where the two are mixing, can't live in either fresh or salt. Some of them can, but not all of them can. So the organisms that live in the fresh water, in the, in the estuary, which is like the middle water, are like in prison. They can't live here and they can't live there. And the things that are coming from the outside reach what? A barrier. They can't go inside. SubhanAllah. It's not just that Allah said, you know, like the earth was created in seven days or whatever. It's very detailed and it's all been completely verified by science. And in things that, 1904 was when they discovered that this estuary exists, the barrier between salt water and sea. Actually, it was later than that. It was Jacques Cousteau who discovered it. In 1904, they discovered that there aren't just waves on the top of the ocean. There are big waves underneath as well. And they're completely separate, and they follow a totally separate pattern. And in the Quran, it says, uh, oh, yeah, I wish I had the ayah, that uh, people who aren't guided are like people, for lying. I'm paraphrasing. If anybody can help me what this ayah is. Um, they're like people, they're like uh, the layers of darkness in the sea. That the first there are clouds, then there are waves, then there are waves upon waves, one, one layer on top of the other. SubhanAllah, 1904, they figured out that this is the case. So Allah uses the parables and descriptions and things that you think is just flowery language, and it's really actually a scientific fact. This is one of the greatest miracles of the Quran because Look at me, Hutchinson, Kansas. I can't understand uh, why, um, you know, Surah uh, Al-Ikhlas is beautiful in Arabic. Now, back in the day, the Arabs, when the Quran first was revealed, they're like, Ya Allah, and a lot of them became Muslim on the spot, the first time they heard an ayah, because they could just tell that that Arabic was divinely inspired. But we don't have access to that, because we're not native Arabic speakers. And even if we were native Arabic speakers, we're not, nowadays, they don't have that great um, literary, oral history kind of poetry culture. 
So we can't, we can't, we can't, we don't have access to that. But we have access to the scientific miracles in the Quran. And guess what? They didn't. There are, if you read like the old descriptions and the old commentaries, a lot of them will say when they come to scientific verses like this, well, you know, we don't know, blah, blah, blah. Or they'll say, you know, they try to explain it according to the knowledge that they had at the time. <coughs> they didn't have access to that, but we have access to that. Allah made sure that every successive generation has something in the Quran for them specifically. Something that calls to the people of that, uh, of that culture and of that generation. So science was the thing that, that called me. So the book that I read is called The Bible of Quran and Science by Maurice Bukai, who's a French physician, who was involved in the uh, excavation of the body of the pharaoh, uh, of Musa, the Musa pharaoh. What's his name? Was he Ramses the same thing? Yes, you know. <laughs> it's probably about a 50% chance of being right, no matter what, some kind of Ramses. Anyway, he was involved in this excavation, and the Quran says, we will save you in your body for future generations. I mean, these are predictions that, that the Quran made the kind of predictions in the Bible it says, you shall know by the prophecy by whether or not it comes true. You'll know it by the fruit. Well, uh, how many prophecies in the Quran? That they, that Allah said, the Romans have just suffered a defeat at the hands of the Persians, but within a few years' time, they'll be victorious. I mean, people thought the Byzantine Empire was on the verge of collapse. Nobody would have predicted that. And yet they, they came back. So many, not just in the not just in Quran itself, but in the Hadith and the Zira literature. So science was what spoke to me about Islam. 